welcome. It's so exciting to see faces here. Um, after the last two years, this is fantastic. I am not uh, Anthony Schrag. I am uh, Jennifer Gordon, and I am the director of both Humber Galleries as well as one of our centers of innovation for Humber College, the Center for Creative Business Innovation. I'm going to get us started today uh, with a basic land acknowledgement. Humber College is located within the traditional and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, known as Adobigok, the place of the alders in Michisagi language. The region is uniquely situated along Humber River watershed, which historically provided an integral connection for Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wyandot peoples between the Ontario Lakeshore and the Lake Simcoe Georgian Bay regions. Now home to people of numerous nations, Adobegoke continues to provide a vital source of interconnection for all. So as I read that, I'm reflecting on my own history, my own family history, um, and I'm thinking about the land that we're on. And I'm thinking a lot about making space for Indigenous voices. Um, it's ridiculous that that has to be said today and now, but uh, it, it does, and we are actively making space for stories to be told and recorded and shared um, through our Indigenous Transmedia Fellowship, one of the five fellowships that we're running. So, Dr. Anthony Schrag is a practicing artist and researcher and senior lecturer at Queen Margaret's University in Edinburgh. The central focus of his work explores participatory art and social practices, exploring the role of art outside of museums and art galleries, and is specifically interested in the role of productive conflict, we're gonna have a fun lecture, within community settings. He leads on both the MA Arts, Festivals and Cultural Management, and the MA Applied Arts and Social Practice, and is a member of the Center for Communication, Cultural and Media Studies Research Center, leading the Practice Research Cluster, Finding and Using Creative Knowledge. We're thrilled to have Dr. Anthony Schrag here. Uh, he has been a lovely partner with Humber. Uh, he opened for us two years ago at our Culture's Compass um, uh, conference, which is one of our five fellowships that, that runs with the, the keynote lecture there. And there's a lot of tie-ins we've been discussing between, between the work that Humber is doing to, um, to really let students know and, and, and practitioners know that what, what we do as creatives is research. It is research. It is very akin to the scientific process. Uh, it follows a lot of those investigative, iterative, um, observation, note-taking, all of that sort of reflective pieces as you go towards creating something with the end goal that uh, communicates what it is that you would like for it to communicate. His work it also spreads across um, socioeconomic lines, which is something that I am very passionate about. And he has done projects um, with relational aesthetics. So for those of you that uh, are new to what relational aesthetics are and some of these other terms, this is going to be a fantastic intro um, today. So his work uses the body within space to wake us up to what's around us and language as well, right? And I just came back from New York. Uh, I was down there with um, the uh, World Voices for Pen America Festival, and they were talking a lot about banned books and what's happening um, across the world with intolerance. And I've been thinking about how, you know, language, written language, is one of the things that, you know, if you want to talk about separating us, which I'd rather talk about how we're int integrated, but separates humans from, from other species on the planet. It's the innovation and the technological tool of the written language. And words can lead us into war. They can lead us into separation and division. But they can also bring us together and inspire and innovate and heal and provide a sense of hope. So with that, I welcome Dr. Anthony Schrag. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Jen. Um, I hope it's okay. I'm going to uh, keep my mask off because talking for a long time, it might be a little bit muffled. I have tested hundreds of times. They wouldn't even allow me in the country if I didn't test, so don't worry. I'm fine. <laughs> um, but thank you very much for both having me um, and for that really wonderful introduction. Uh, I will do my best to stay relatively still, but I have a tendency, as some people know me, to get a little bit... <laughs> kinetic. Um, uh, I'm really grateful to be here today and I will um, touch on uh, creative research and, and cultural practice um, to look at, at uh, I suppose, some of the stuff that sets, um, I'm really interested in right now. But I'm going to start off with a sort of brief um, 
10 minute contextualization of some of the articulation agreements that we have with Humber, which is because I think it's important that students are aware of, of their um, uh, options within the partnerships. I'll then talk a little bit about my context and then I'll move towards that creative practice stuff. But I should say, I am more than happy if you have a question, if I'm speaking too fast, if I'm getting too excited and I'm just talking mile a minute, please feel free to throw something at me and get my attention and, and, and ask a question. Very happy for that to happen. So um, just briefly, I, um, as, as, as Jen said, I'm from uh, Queen Margaret's University and obviously there are long and embedded relationships between Scotland and Canada, um, you know, be they social, cultural, um, but also governmental and economic. And there's, there's reasons that our governments work together to be able to sort of provide um, sharing of information. And that includes cultural knowledge. Um, so there's a sort of bigger grounding of, of, of why I'm here as well. There's also important, I should say, um, that where I'm based in Edinburgh, the city of culture, um, it's a significant place for, um, uh, festivals, the, the premier festival city, um, and that when the, the partnerships that Queen Margaret's has um, to national, international organizations that are based in Edinburgh are, are really quite diverse and quite um, uh, impressive, I think. And so actually when I start talking about the articulation agreements, I just want you to kind of recognize that as students you would have access to, to, um, to many of these resources and to be able to use them. Um, and we want that. And, 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 and it's important when we say Edinburgh and we say the Edinburgh Festival, everyone thinks, oh yeah, it's the festival. <laughs> it's not just a festival. <laughs> there are hundreds of them and they all happen at the same time. There's the book festival, the music festival, the dance festivals, the children's festival, the science festival, the art festival, the science, the all, of, all of the festivals, if there's a, think of it, there's a festival for it. <laughs> uh, and yeah, and, 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 and it's, and, it's um, and, and that in itself presents itself as a really amazing place to study, cultural management, applied arts, social practice, all those sorts of things, but also about reflecting on how culture isn't also inherently a good thing. And actually, this is a really thing to maybe ground some of that speaking. You know, if it's, if, if it's a city of 500,000 people, which it is in Edinburgh, and in August that changes to 2.7 million, how does that really start to affect the infrastructure of the city? Does that mean that actually the culture is making it a unlivable city for the locals? And how do we as cultural managers and people who work within this context really reflect it? So the site of Edinburgh as well is kind of important to reflect on. And we have a huge cultural focus at QMU. There's a currently um, um, several articulation agreements, and I'm going to talk about them in just a second. But um, the current articulation agreement we have um, is, is the MA Arts Festivals of Cultural Management, but we are looking to expand those to include my projects, my, my new MA, which is the Applied Arts and Social Practice. But the idea of an articulation agreement basically allows students who studied at Humber to have a certain amount of credits to then come and study with us at a reduced rate um, and often getting your master's in a much quicker um, time period than you would if you studied a two-year two -year period in Canada. Um, so just uh, briefly, the articulation agreements that we offer are kind of two, two, two parts. Um, they're the accelerated MA degree, so if you have an undergraduate degree in Humber, um, you can then articulate onto a master's degree in uh, Queen Margaret's University. For one year, you'd also get a 10% discount on your fees, and again, you would complete your master's degree much quicker in Edinburgh. Why would you not want to do that? <laughs> um, uh, and also, uh, the, the um, credit exemption for students who've taken the arts management degrees here, or, uh, or the other uh, certificate and diplomas, um, you're able to then articulate onto the master's degree course with having um, reduced amount of credits and uh, therefore reduced amount of fees to pay, which is wonderful because who wants to have less fees? We all do. Um, I did, just as, just as a sort of experiment in my head, I did do a sort of like quick assessment of, of uh, equivalent master's degrees in the UK. You could study in London for 25 grand or you could study in Queen Margaret's for 11. Just saying, just putting that out there. Um, I'm more than happy to share these slides for people to want more. Um, in terms of Humber, the, the arts festivals and cultural management um, articulation um, means that we would have, uh, we have six core modules and we have a dissertation project. You'd be exempt from two of those, those uh, core modules. Um, and that doesn't mean to say you, you don't need to, you don't want, if you don't want to come to our other modules that you're exempt from. You can if you want to. You can come and come on all the field trips. You just don't have to do the assignment. Even better, right? So you get all the benefits without having to do the work. Um, <laughs> you do do the work. It's the work is internal. Um, um, 
I'll talk a little bit about the dissertation in just a second, because uh, when I talk about the, the MA, uh, I, can, I can unpick some of those. So uh, what I'm going to do is show you a very short video uh, that's three minutes long from a Humber student who went to Canada, that, uh, who went to Queen Margaret's to give you a, a brief example. Again, it's three minutes, and then um, I'll talk a little bit about the programs, and then I'll move on to the, the, the content of, of the talk. Hi, I'm Katie. Um, I'm from Canada. I'm here doing the MA in Arts Festival and Cultural Management. Um, and I came to QMU via, uh, via um, a matriculation agreement with Humber College back home in Canada. The thing that attracted me to Scotland and QMU, um, I knew I wanted to study abroad at some point in my life. Um, and uh, I had been looking into programs here in the UK and it just kind of happened with uh, the partnership agreement back home. In Canada and also just the program here, it aligned with what I was looking for. So in terms of like applying for the program, it was really easy to do so. Um, I think I had a lot of help uh, from the international office in terms of my application um, and the program coordinators were really good at giving me all the information I needed. So my program in general has been really uh, great in terms of uh, communication. All of our tutors are really involved in our education, which I think is really great, and as is the international office as well. So the program has been exactly what I wanted it to be. Um, I did a very similar program back home in Canada. I had a lot of questions when I left that program in Canada. I think it was a really good starting place, but um, I wanted to kind of ask more questions and that's exactly what the program here has been. Uh, so the thing that was really great when I arrived here is uh, the class sizes seem relatively small, um, big enough that you can have a good conversation but small enough that you feel like you have a chance to talk. In terms of like highlight, I definitely think the uh, qualitative research class with Dr. David Stevenson is like amazing. He's an amazing lecturer and it was really a good um, point uh, of getting me interested in doing research in this field. In terms of activities that I've done um, while being here, um, I'm one of the class reps for my program, which I think was a really good choice for me just because it got me a little bit more involved in my program, a little bit more um, involved in how my education was gonna go. And on top of that, I've also had the opportunity to do a small scale research project with a local arts organization. And that definitely was only possible through connections made through this program. So that was really cool. So getting the Salter Scholarship uh, definitely has been more than I expected. I learned about it from the international office. Uh, like I said, the people from the office have been really great about giving me all the resources. And I applied for it, not really thinking that I was going to get it. And uh, when I did, it was amazing. And then when I got here and realized all the things that they were going to do for us, we got to go on a three-day trip to celebrate, celebrate Burns Day here, and it was like absolutely amazing. We started in Glasgow, we went down to Ayr to like where Burns uh, grew up, I guess, and then ended up in Edinburgh. I think we get 8,000 pounds to or it's our tuition for a one-year master's program. I think in terms of anyone who's thinking about applying for the program, um, make sure you're ready to invest yourself into the program. I think the people who are enjoying this course in particular are the ones who were already interested in what was going on in the arts sector. So if you're kind of just looking to get a job, I don't know that this is exactly the right course for you. I think it's more about looking to wait, uh, work out what's going on and how you can make it better.
what it, how it can be better. So on one side you have um, the Arts and Festivals Cultural Management course, and that really looks at what are the contextual understandings of arts and cultural management. So taking the idea that you know I, I work in a, in a factory and I make a widget and I get that widget and I sell that widget, that's going to sustain me to be able to keep running. Can art really work like that? If art and culture is somehow that's something that's effective, that's about our emotions, that's about intangible culture, can we really manage it and market it in the same way that we might do a business, i.e. I made a thing and I sold it? And so in the Arts Festival Cultural Management Program, we really try and provide a set of context by which you can really reflect on that. And we do that through a series of, of, of courses. Again, these, these slides are available online and I'm more than happy to share with you. I'm not just going to read what's on there, but um, they're really for me to remember what I'm saying. Um, we all come from, um, the, the, the lecturers on the course come from really diverse backgrounds to be able to help you interrogate those questions. So for example, Dr. David Stevenson has worked within the sort of the um, enterprise sector for many years. He's also a cultural theorist who's done his, dis his dissertation on, his thesis on non-participation, what that means. Um, Dr. Rebecca Finkel looks very much into events management from this point of a feminist leadership style. I came from a very participatory arts artistic background, so I come from that kind of background, the, 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 the delivery side of things. Rachel um, uh, wrote Scotland's cultural policy, the one before last, and Alice McGrath is a real person. We just She's such a new staff, we haven't got a picture of her yet, <laughs> but she has worked in the sector of the field, uh, uh, the, the theatre sector for many, many years. So we all come from this really kind of diverse background to be able to situate your learning within the centre, to kind of interrogate what does that mean and, and how do you really ask those questions from your perspective. We look at a variety of different um, courses. We only teach Thursdays and Fridays, and then from that point of view, you're kind of th th to be able to explore your work within the field. We have lots of, of opportunities within the sector to work, um, and we we have these these three modules per terms, um, including um, uh, a dissertation within the final module. And the dissertation is either a written piece, you could do a business plan, or you could do an actual live project, go and set up a project. So we don't situate research in that very traditional way of write something and that's it. Um, I should say we have both January and, and September starts, and it doesn't matter which, which way you start from. It's quite similar for, uh, and I should also say, sorry, I forgot about the slide, this idea that you actually get lived experience within the sector, and we, we very much provide opportunities to go out and work with Lyceum, with Edinburgh Festival, with um, printmakers, to name, to name just a few. Um, and we also have several other activities, including a Venice Fellowship, where one of our students can go and study in Venice for a month um, as part of their work, and we do often do a rural tour, I can't say that word, <laughs> rural, rural, rural um, where we basically jump in a bus and we drive around the north of Scotland and look at rural culture and how does that mean, how does it be, need to be managed differently. In terms of the uh, applied arts and social practice, it's a very similar context again, which is looking at what does it mean to, to when arts is now less and less about thing in a museum or in a gallery or in a theater when it's about its relationship with um, the publics, with communities, when it's addressing socioeconomic contexts, when it's addressing a variety of political issues, activists. How do we do that effectively? Um, and how do, we, how do we research that in a way that allows us to ask um, specific questions? And so we really kind of examine the ethics of this type of work, the history of this kind of work, and look at what, is it, what do those processes of engagement mean? Very similarly, we have a kind of diverse background. Um, again, Dr. Victoria Villa, she is a real person, just haven't got a picture of her because she just started really recently. Um, she came from a heritage and theater background. Um, Andy comes from a more archive and documentation, filmic side. Andy has worked, uh, Irvin has worked in, in prisons and, and with uh, young people for many, many years. And I, of course, come from a more participatory arts. So we come again from a very, very diverse perspective. And we, like the cultural management program, we only teach on Thursdays and Fridays. And the idea is that over those sort of 12 weeks, you're really examining your, that work from the point of view of, of you as a practitioner within that context. And again, January uh, and September starts with the uh, final dissertation being an actual lived project that you do with the community that we set you up with or that you, you if you want to return home to do that here, you're very welcome to do. I should say just because of COVID is, has happened, it's, an on, it's not an online course. We are very much a face-to-face -face course because we think that, that, that grounded learning that you have are essential. And more than happy to talk more about that in, with, um, after this with more students. But I think what I'll do is I'll jump on to sort of the core of what I was in really interested in, in, in reflecting with you, this notion of research and about how creative practice research specifically uh, can be utilized um, within cultural organizations. What I'll do is I'm gonna start with a little bit of a video that frames some of my practice. Um, and this video, I suppose, is useful to help um, think about 
What does it mean to, oh, that's my, I didn't shut my email off. Uh, what does it mean to um, work with uh, other people? So I originally studied, uh, um, my first degree uh, was, in, was in writing, and then I did a, 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 a visual arts degree. Um, and I was really interested in photography and film at the first, and I thought, oh, I'll make these films which are really like about me doing fancy things. And so what I'm doing here is I'm hooking my feet to the underneath of the stairs, and it looks like I'm walking upstairs, but I'm actually I'm upside down. I've flipped the camera. Now, I don't show this clip to say I'm great, I can hang from my toes. I mean, I am great because I can hang from my toes. But I show it for this clip, and this is me and my preparation for doing this work. And while I was preparing, I had forgot to lock the door in this very busy office building, and because I'd forgotten to lock the door in a building that's filled with hundreds of other people, as I was practicing, the lady came down the stairs accidentally. And looking back on that, I kind of went, oh, that's much better. That's a much more interesting piece of work because it's about how someone else has changed it. It's not about me and my work. It's about engaging other people. And I remember having a, um, a conversation with, 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 with someone about this. And so even though I had, I had studied photography and, and this idea of making artwork that is a sort of a tangible thing that you could put on a wall. Uh, I was a very bad photographer. I used to sort of leap out of the frame and, and kind of get lost a lot and, and was all very blurry. But I remember having this conversation about this work and, and, and she was saying, Les Megor, that art is the thing that challenges perceptual habits. And this kind of becomes interesting when we start talking about research because research is about knowledge, which is about habits and things that we know about. So rather than thinking about art as an object that you sell, can we start thinking of culture as a process of thinking difference? Can we start thinking about how we can utilize art as a way to, to challenge um, the uh, expected ways of knowing? So I was quite excited by this, and so I went out into the world, and I would do things like this, which got me in trouble with a lot of the health and safety people because I was plugging in live wires. Or I would do something like this, which again would, would uh, also get me in trouble. These are these are wires that you find in toasters. So when you plug it in, the piece kind of starts to, to burn and the fire brigade comes and Anthony gets in a lot of trouble. So I stopped doing things like that, but I kind of went back to the things that I was very, uh, I guess, grounded in, which was my body and the sense of physicality and exploring how my um, physicality or the, or, the, or the role of a body in the world anybody, your bodies, our bodies in the world, can start to really challenge those perceptual habits. And so I would do things like this, or here's me in China with some lovely confused Chinese ladies. Here's me in Glasgow with some lovely confused Glaswegian people. Um, but the idea of this work was really to try and challenge the way that, that, that our bodies could challenge different ways of being in the world. Um, and uh, <laughs> I love that guy in the corner. He's just doesn't really know what's going on. A lot of people say, oh, it's not his art that hangs on walls, it's him, which is quite hilarious for the 18,000th time you've heard it. Uh, any guesses on how I'm doing this? This is not Photoshopped. You know, you're not allowed to say anything. I think you might know too, actually. No? Yeah. Any other guesses? Not books, no. Uh, hooks, no, not hooks, no, no, no. Although you're on the right track. Because if you went back, you'd see these shoes. And these shoes are chained to the wall. Uh, which is funny, because if I fall, then my feet stay in the shoes and my body doesn't. So you know, you gotta stay, you gotta stay up. But I suppose with a lot of, all of this work, I was I, I, as I was sort of trying to explore a lot of it, it was very much gallery-based. So this idea that people would come into the gallery. Turn that down a bit, shall I? I'll do that. Sorry. Um, that idea that, that, that all of this was my body, and I was trying to start getting other people's bodies involved, because actually, there's very little point if it's just me, right? So how do I get other people involved in that process of thinking differently? And so with these works, it was very much about making the gallery or this art site, the site of art, as something that's aggressive. It's not just something you look at, but actually something that's kind of like leaps at you and physically has this physical response. Um, sometimes it works quite well, but other times it's different. <laughs> it didn't. But I suppose within all of this work, I was trying to start to engage other people in this process. So I would make works like this, which is seven and a half meters long, which is about the half size of this room, and I would strap it to my back and then go for a walk downtown Sucky Hall Street in Glasgow, <laughs> getting trapped between signs, getting, you know, knocking people over, and, 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 
uh, piece of advice if you do have a seven and a half meter sign strapped to your back and you go for a walk downtown Glasgow after a football match and a bunch of men come and start spinning you around and around and around. There's very little you can do about that. You just have to go with it. But I suppose what I was cluing into was this idea that this thing was not the artwork. The artwork was the interrelational experiences that I was having with people. And this is, I suppose, one of the sort of main key tenets of, of starting to talk about social practice and art in, art in the public realm as a sort of research is, is recognizing that um, if the object isn't the art, but it's a clue to the mechanisms of the art, can that be used in a functional way to be able to think about culture being used in a, in a productive way? And, and so with this work, I started to kind of explore, um, I suppose, how, uh, how I could be in the public realm. But I suppose within that, institutions were starting to frame how culture works. And this is kind of gets starts to be problematic. So this was a piece of work that was supposed to really reflect on the notion of violence within a very difficult area of Glasgow. And so I kind of proposed this work called um, The Human Piñata, which ostensibly is, is a project to get young Glaswegian children to hit me with sticks. Um, but the point, I suppose, was I was trying to sort of say is that in a half an hour performance, I am not going to change anything <laughs> with the, that's the notion of their experience, of their socioeconomically difficult contexts. It's impossible. So could I use art as a way to approach things differently? Could I use it to have a conversation? Could I use it to open up a, 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 um, an, a, a space? Because the recognition was that I wasn't ever going to be able to fix it. We can't use art in that way because to do so, I suppose, is a bit like greenwashing or you know, art washing, is that nothing's going to change. Because I suppose the, the, the concept that, that art can do good, and again, this is the sort of problematics we need to think about it, especially, and, and this is this, this stuff very much more so than, than, than in the cultural management course, in the applied arts and social practice course, we recognize and th reflect on this notion of doing good and art and culture doing good, because actually, remember the whole promise, premise of colonialization was premised on doing good. So actually, how do we make sure that art isn't doing those processes? And, and I suppose what I do is I reflect on this, this quote by Edward Said quite a lot, which is that idea that every empire tells itself and the world that it is unlike all other empires, that its mission is not to plunder and to control, but to actually educate and to liberate. And the reason I find this problematic with these words highlighted at the end is how many times have has art been positioned, especially in socioeconomically difficult contexts, as educational and liberational, when actually what's happening is there's some form of cultural colonization going on. Um, and so we really need to reflect on this notion of, of how we're positioning art within the social construct. And to me, this is fundamentally about infrastructures. And this is why studying arts management is really, really essential. And arts festivals, cultural management, is because actually this is about the behind the scenes. This is not about the delivery of the artwork. That's not about the artist. Sometimes can be. There are artists who are assholes. Let's accept that. But actually, what is the infrastructure of how culture is being managed and how it's being set up? Because it's those infrastructures that are actually um, ethically imbued. They're, they're the infrastructures that have um, power that's built in within. So how do we make these work effectively? And, and just to give you an example, we know this work, right? Most of you will know this work. This is John, Loco, John, John Lennon, Yoko Ono's uh, hair piece, bed piece, which was a uh, resistance against the um, uh, Vietnam War. And it was going to basically stand out to critique that war. And they're going to stay in bed and grow their hair long because it's a critique. Great piece, right? Got that ethically f right on against the war. What's less known is this picture. So this is John and Yoko waiting for the maid to make the bed so that they continue to protest against the system. Doesn't match, right? Doesn't match. <laughs> so that question of how we have an infrastructure, i.e., are, are you just doing an art piece that just ticks the boxes, or are you actually physically looking at how we change the system? Because to me, and I forgive my swearing, I go back to this point often, which is that art won't save the world. Go volunteer at a soup kitchen, you pretentious fuck. Because there are far more effective ways to change the world. Working in a soup kitchen is a far more effective way to make change than making art. So let's think about what art can actually do. So what can art and design, how can it operate effectively within the social realm? And, and I'm going to talk about maybe three or four projects that, that I hope, I think, sort of start to frame um, a way of thinking, i.e. using artists as research, to challenge some of these ideas, to interrogate different ideas, to come up with different data sets, to come up with different ways of being in the world. 
that I think are more conducive to supporting arts and cultures than the traditional numeric statistical um, value, uh, those sorts of values. Um, before I do that, is there any questions? Is everyone okay? Sure, all good. In the interweb, you're all okay? Awesome, good. Um, so one of the projects that I think, I, where, I, where I think this bit started for me, where I started thinking about how we can use research or cultural research in a way that's different to intervene, to kind of get new knowledge, was a project that came about when I was working at uh, the Gallery of Modern Art in Glasgow. And with the Gallery of Modern Art, the idea would be that uh, they have these human rights and contemporary arts projects. And with this piece that I would um, uh, make work with young people in three areas of Glasgow, Torrey Glen, Shettleston, Easter House. And I would make artwork with these kids. The, this artwork would then go about sectarianism, about the Catholic Protestant issue uh, in, in Glasgow. We would make artwork about this. This artwork would then go back to the Gallery of Modern Art and be displayed in some ways. And then, um, then their lives would be better. We fixed them through art. Well done, people. Pat on the back. Um, and I, and, I, and I always have to point this out, is that this image, and this kid's great, and he's wonderful, but his dad has just been in a fight, and there's still blood on the golf club. And you're kind of going, sorry, what is art supposed to do here? How is art actually going to effectively make change within this context of systemic poverty and systemic violence? How is a three-month project going to actually initially change that? And so I went back to the people who commissioned me, which is the Gallery of Modern Art in this big neoclassical building in the middle of town, which is very obviously wealthy and affluent. And I said to the people who commissioned me, I really want to have a meeting about what you think art and culture is going to do here. How, what, where, where does that come from? What are you thinking that that's about? And so they said, oh, great idea. The, big, the city councillors and, and local authority people came. And, and um, when they came to the big the marble hall where they meet, the big round oak table and the red velvet chairs were missing. And they said, oh, I thought, I thought we were having a meeting. And I said, no, no, we are having a meeting. Come downstairs. Come downstairs. And I, and I threw them into a back of a van and I kidnapped them. And I drove them out to one of these areas. And I said, well, we are going to have a meeting, but we're going to have it in and amongst the lives of the people that you think you're going to change. So I'm going to take you out of that office building, and I'm going to have that space here. Not everyone is very happy about that, I should say. <laughs> but that point of, I suppose, uh, that notion of, of making a difference, right? Who gets to decide what that difference is? And, and how, how can an artistic process start to intervene to that process? And that, again, goes to thinking about art. This is, I suppose, that point for me where I was thinking, OK, rather than being a mechanism of delivery, i.e. outdoors. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to deliver it as public facing. What if we shifted art as a process of thinking and pushed it towards organizations? What if we actually went, actually, rather than putting it out, what if we put it in? And what happens then? How do we shift those organizational changes? How do we develop different sorts of thinking? And oops, repeated, oh, repeated slides. <laughs> um, but to, to, uh, uh, so my PhD ended up being about this. So a lot of my research is very much about what is the relationship between um, what you might call a dominant power, i.e. a museum, a gallery, a university, people with resources, the artists who make those artworks, um, and then the public who received those artworks. Um, if anyone can figure that diagram out, that'd be really helpful, because I submitted that for my PhD, and they seem to say it worked, but <laughs> still have no clue. I suppose to simplify it, I suppose what I get really interested in is what this, this um, um, uh, artist said, Anne-Marie Kopstick once said, which is, I, I work with people who are not me. And uh, that's kind of a funny thing to say, yeah, I work with people who are not me. But that point of the not me thing becomes very important, because it recognizes that the public is a plural domain. There are lots of people who are not me. I, I use my grandmother problem all the time. My grandmother, five foot nine, or four foot nine, I should say. <laughs> hair like the queen, would throw herself in front of a bus to save me, uh, loved me inherently, also a racist Tory. Not a bad person. How do we understand that person in relationship to me in a public realm? That becomes difficult because we're talking about multiple plural discourses. But that point about the, how we work in that multiple plural discourses is really important because we have to understand that we're not trying to create a world that is uniform. We have, we're having to operate in a world that's multiple. So with a lot of that, that notion, I'm trying to take 
the, the artworks that we do and frame it within the organization. And this was not something that I invented. This is something very much grounded within the artist placement group who were operating in the 1960s uh, uh, to the 80s, really. And they kind of came up with this notion of an artist working within cultural organizations. They came up with this idea of residencies. Um, and, and they had this process called the, the context is half the work, which was that no matter where you're working, you have to work for the context that you're being made for. And that's about being sensitive to the communities that you're in. And those communities might be cultural organizations. But the idea of pushing people out into spaces became really important to me because what I would do is, I, I, and now again, this is where I'm going to talk about these three projects, um, which I can do in this time that we have, I've just checked, um, was about then kind of taking those creative acts. So rather than, again, rather than thinking about art as an object, how can we take art as a process of thinking, i.e. a research process, and, and place it within the sites to create new ideas? So one of the projects was based with Glasgow Life, who are a cultural organization who deliver um, culture and leisure services to all of the cities of Glasgow, so all of the, the citizens of Glasgow. And, and it was the time I did this project was at the time of the Commonwealth Games, it was 2014. And so I kind of took this sports methodology because they also delivered the sports element. So I sort of took these creative physical methodologies into this organization. And I would do very sort of, I guess, simple things to start, you know, this idea of, of, of a hopscotch in an office. And, and, and this idea was creating new movement might create new ways of thinking. I was just kind of trying to get people to integrate differently, to think very differently. Or I, I did a project like this where by which I kind of, this very big open plan office, uh, I was very aware that, that uh, even though the, op the, the sort of policy was everyone is equal, we're all open plan, there's no hierarchies here, the managers did sit behind a very big divider. It was literally just a very big bunch of walls. And so all I did was just make a sign and go, well, you're obviously some people are more equal than others because you sit behind a very big divider. And they went, oh, shit, fuck, we have to take this down. So they took it down because it wasn't matching up with that notion of, of their policies. And this is where I start to kind of start to, to, to draw in other um, theoretical frameworks because there is an acceptable um, methodological process of research called interpretive policy analysis. And interpretive policy analysis, while it sounds boring, is really fascinating because what it says is that there are, um, uh, if you read a space or if you read outfits or if you read the way that meetings happen as policy, it tells you what the underlying values are. So the underlying values of this organization was that actually these people were all equal, but these were more equal because they were behind that. So you can use, this, you can use multiple methodological processes within a concept of, of, of culture to really start to interrogate some of these ideas. The, I guess the humorous bit and the way that I, was, I started to use a lot of my physically based artwork to kind of come to new ideas was, came out of this idea that I recognized that not a lot of people knew each other and I was trying to, and there was also a lot of like unseen angst in the building. <laughs> I was like, I need to address this angst. So I literally put up a poster that said, Glasgow Light Fife Cl Fight Club, 5 p.m. basement. That was it. That was it, Fridays. And in that process, uh, just kind of set up new uh, opportunities for interaction. Um, which, yeah, stupid, really stupid, but actually, started to kind of create and formulate new social relationships. New social relationships that had never existed before and allowed different sorts of conversation to start emerging that had never existed before. So this was the policy team. They took a tag team against me. I was not impressed with that. I will, I will just go forward to some of the... Um, this woman had a lot of anger issues. And then this guy didn't tell me he also happened to be the national judo champion. <laughs> but I suppose what I, what, what, what <laughs> I suppose it, <laughs> it, it is important, I suppose, to, to kind of laugh at those things, but actually that is a space, that, that, that humor is a space for thinking. It is a space for reflection. It is a space for gathering new insights, for creating new insights. You know, the whole idea with, with, the, with creative practice research is that it's about human imagination. And actually, we can't now jump onto that and jumping ahead. What I will do is I'll finish up this project by talking about um, what my final piece for them was, was that I was really interested in their cultural policy. And their cultural policy that they didn't have, but they were working from their strategic vision, was to inspire Glasgow citizens and visitors to lead richer and more active lives through culture and sport. And I guess 
what I, what, so what I did was I walked around the office giving everyone 10 pence if they did a push-up or a jumping jack, thereby making them richer and more active. I've done that. Policy complete. We can shut down the organization because that's the best way to do it. 10p, jumping jack, you've done it. Again, a bit like the, like, like the wrestling, ridiculous, but from that I was able to then turn to the policymakers who were writing their cultural policy and go, yeah, you're absolutely right. This is obtuse language. I talked about language at the start. You know, if you, if you have this idea that, that policy forms culture, which it does, we have to get that right. Right? So if we're using obtuse language, and if we're using things that don't really mean anything, or we're not interrogating that, that's going to affect culture, which is going to affect people's lives. So actually, this piece of work, the richer and more active thing, changed Glasgow Life's policy directly. So yeah, a stupid artwork, but it has lasting impacts. And I think I hope, kind of, I suppose, was how we do that in, 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 in the cultural sector, is that it's a lot about how our self-value then goes to that. Because I suppose we're already, um, we already use a lot of numerical statistical language within value. We, we justify, people came to my shows, therefore it's good, right? I've got numbers, right? So if, we, if we're, we're, we're based within the cultural context, why are we not valuing cultural knowledge? Right? So why do we defer to these uh, numerical, statistical, quantitative structures to back up and justify art and culture when actually our art and culture is significantly useful? Right? So we have this really weird, um, uh, I, I guess it's an insecurity within the cultural sector that we can't actually stand up for cultural knowledge. We think actually, no, science knowledge is best. And so I'm really interested within the creative, creative, creative research cluster is to be able to go, no, no, we can use creative knowledge to make change. And we can use that to, to, to argue for our, our, our sector. So I'll talk briefly about this, this last project that I've done, and then I'll kind of just make space for, for questions and discussions. Um, but uh, it was about um, the Cultural Sustainable Prosperity Project. I should say, just kind of jumping back slightly, um, my, my work within the, the um, uh, practice research cluster is fundamentally about supporting multiple different types of, of creative practice. So we have filmmakers, we have people who are poets, we have people who come from multiple perspectives to be able to use art and culture in their field, in their way, in their domain to, to develop cultural knowledge. So in some ways creative practice or what you might call creative led practice is a, it can be about the practice itself. So it's about filmmaking, it's about um, new ideas, but you can also have practice-based culture. And practice-based culture is when you use the, the, the practice to find out different knowledge. So for example, I'm going to use creative activities to explore tap dancing and the elderly. I'm going to use it towards puppet making and sex work. You can, right? So it's, it's, it's practice based or it's practice led. But the core of that is the practice, is the creative work. So I, I suppose what, what, what I'm kind of pushing on with that is that um, once we, we start to ground that creative work or, or that creative thinking as a process of, of imagination, we can start to frame the research in a way that's about challenging traditional ways of thinking. Um, so the creative, uh, the Cultural Sustainable Prosperity Project is a research project that, that um, I recently got with three colleagues. Um, and it's uh, really to sort of look at, um, in a post-COVID world, um, th there was a reduction of things of culture, right? So we, we had to stop, certainly in the UK, we had to stop everything. The theaters were closed, museums were closed, everything was closed. Yet, within that, there was a really significant scope for ecological development, right? So suddenly we noticed that there was less pollution, there were birds, there were, there were everything. Like ecologically, there was a really fantastic surge. So within that, we started thinking about this idea of, of cultural sustainable prosperity. Um, which was really about how do we think about what happened with COVID to try and think about how we might live better. And that notion of living better is obviously problematic. How do we define better? But um, the notion of sustainable prosperity is, is, is an is interesting one because it's different from sustainable development. In fact, I'm going to give the sustainable development first. Sustainable development, uh, it's a development as in growth. So sustainable development is that um, 
uh, we are thinking about um, uh, capacity building uh, and the related to issues including water, energy, climate, oceans, urbanization, transport, site, and technology of sustainable development goals. It's a UN process which is about the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their own needs. Now that's a great idea. We think that's good. I'm assuming everyone in the idea thinks that. Sustainable prosperity, however, shifts that definition slightly because sustainable prosperity is fundamentally how do we live how do we live well with less so sustainable development is continuous growth there is still growth within that whereas sustainable prosperity is about degrowth and it's about thinking about in a cultural sector how we might think about not only um, ecologically but also tied to questions of public health well-being uh, equity happiness social justice um, and so it ties in a lot more than just an economic argument of, of development. So with sustainable prosperity, we started thinking about this notion of cultural sustainable prosperity. And that goes back to this idea that cultural, well, I, I'm going to say two words, cultural producers. That's what we do. We produce culture. In the production, we make more. We constantly make. That's what we do. We're cultural people who just keep making, making shit. We've got more stuff. Like, but actually, do we need more stuff in the world? But is the argument of cultural sustainable prosperity that we do well that we do less? Like, is that an argument we want to make? Do we want to make an argument that we do less culture? Because that seems antithetical to everything that we do. So what we tried to do is take this, um, uh, I guess, place-based approach, and we looked at three sites, which is Edinburgh um, uh, as an urban center, using Summerhall, which is a private company, um, Urban Peripheral, and a place called Donegal, um, uh, and not Donegal, sorry, Don Leary, um, looking at, locational, uh, looking at a, a local authority, and then we looked at a rural site, being Huntley, which is a charity third sector organization. So you have three places, urban, urban peripheral, rural, and three types of organizations, public, private, um, and a, what you might call a, um, a third sector, a charity organization. And was thinking about what, what, what is going on with these projects. So what we did in this project is we just wanted to say to each of these cultural organizations, what do you do? Tell me what you do and how have you th thought about that through COVID? And I could sit down with you in an interview process and ask you that, or I could refer to the fact that you are creative practitioners and we could actually go and make things and do things together to be able to understand that. So a lot of that was like walking tours, a lot of that was looking at creative projects, we made videos, we sort of did creative activities with these people um, that were about the organization themselves. But also what we did is we went out to, to the practitioners who worked with those organizations and made works with them. So it was things like there was... Um, um, uh, lots of gardening projects during COVID. They had these um, honesty boxes, which were boxes by which you know no one could go, but they, so the, the shop was closed, but people could actually go and get stuff and leave money for free. You know, buy a loaf of bread and leave two pounds or whatever. Um, so it was no one manning it, but it was but it became this site of community, and so we built part of these things to think about, well, could a cultural organization not have people involved like this honesty box? Could we then look at gardening projects by which we're not then employing artists to think about that, but actually turning back to um, uh, our agricultural farmers who work in this area anyway to partner with creative projects. So we're not actually making more, we're looking at what's there. Or um, one a really amazing project that came out was um, flax spinning within this context of um, uh, uh, cotton production, making clothes. So Huntley was a really interesting site that um, uh, originally had massive flax spinning projects. Um, we, noticed, we did this project by which we grew flax with these people, and then we invited people to come and find us how to spin flax to make cotton to be able to make clothes. And of course, that slows everything down. What was really fascinating, though, is the kind of un unseen things that emerge out of these projects. Because what we were realizing with flax, pro with this flax spinning project was that the gender Im Im uh, critiques embedded into clothes making. So this question of a spinster, we all know what a spinster is. A spinster is a woman who is never married, comes from someone who spins flax. Because when they made the, the when, they, when they formalized and industrialized the spinning process, it chained women to the home. Previously to that, the drop spindles by which women would walk, they could walk, they could engage, they would make um, uh, cotton and cloth and engage with people. When they industrialized the spinning process, i.e. when they start the, the start of industrial revolution and they gave women spinning wheels, it chained them to the home. 
It, they, weren't, they couldn't go anywhere. And that's a massive gender issue. That cre creates issues of, of social justice. And so how can we then think of that as a creative project to reconfigure that that starts to critique gender roles? And it was the same thing with the gardening projects with the, or the other, with all these other works. And with these kind of processes, we were using these creative, um, and I, I don't, because we're kind of coming close to the end, I'm recognizing, I don't want to go too much into the, with the findings of that, but I think um, what's a useful way to think about in terms of creative practice is to think about this idea that if we always did what we did, we'd always get what we have. So this idea that creative practice projects utilize and use numeric quantitative research will only replicate what we have now. It will replicate the infrastructures. It will repeat the ways that things have already been done. The joy of creative practice is it allows us to find new ways of gathering research and gathering insights that allows us to do it differently. And, I, and that's, to me, the argument of why we need to do this. And that's the imperative of why we need to use creative practice in this process, because we're not going to change. Those infrastructures will remain the same, and we will still be based on those very kind of uh, quantitative processes. So for me, I kind of think about the idea of, 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 of what Gaia says, is um, maybe reflective practice offers us a way of trying to make sense of the uncertainty in our workplaces and the courage to work completely and ethically at the ed edge of order and chaos. And I think that's what we need to do. We need to have the courage to be able to utilize these creative practices in, a, in new and innovative ways. Um, so I'm going to leave with a bunch of questions. Um, and, and invite questions from yourself as well, but thinking about this idea is how can you center creative research within your own practice? You know, you already are creative people, otherwise you wouldn't be here studying this stuff. How do you do that? How, in what ways can we encourage creative research within the cultural sector? Do you work with organizations who kind of then are just returning back to those numeric quantitative statistical processes? Can you change that? How can we value, how can the value be com communicated more effectively when translated by such work? And creative activities offer the potential to shift paradigms that are essential in the face of the wicked problems such as climate change, social justice, all those things. I think the first time I've breathed <laughs> since I started. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> I very happy to, to either have questions or, or uh, from the interwebs or from I'll, I'll repeat the question if you okay, want. Great, yeah. Great, perfect. How do you, um, because what you like your project is about is projects and whatnot are very creative, and there's times where maybe you're not feeling as creative. <laughs> like, how do you keep going? Right. Uh, so. When you're, not, when you're maybe not feeling like you're as inspired as maybe you have been. Yeah, or yeah. Like, how do you keep going? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a good question. So. So the question, just, for, just to record that for the people, is the question is how do you keep going when, when creative practice is about, well, creative research is fundamentally about a, a sort of creative practice when you're not inspired, when you're not able to kind of keep going. It's a, it's a really good question. I, I would say that um, that's the work. <laughs> like any, any, any piece of, of work that we do, whether that's, you know, a surgeon has to read up or, or, or an accountant has to look up, that's where the work lies for the creative sector is to be able to go, well, I just have to. So I have to be able to think about what I need in order to be creative. And so for me, that's, I gotta sleep well, I gotta get good exercise, I gotta eat well, I gotta be around things that are inspiring. And that's the work. And, and in some ways I go, what a great job. In order to feel better, I have to sleep well and eat nice, <laughs> right? So I'm just gonna do that, that's my job. I can't, I can't, let, I can't, neg I can't um, uh, not pay attention to those necessities. But I would also say that, that creative, Thinking and creative practice, for me certainly, it becomes, um, it, it, it's definitely not easy, but it becomes a process that you can tap in really quickly the more you do it. So that I know, for example, I'm going to need to um, go with a book and sit in town and look at people. I know, f I know the sort of creative processes I need to do to be able to kickstart that question. Um, 
and that's mine, and it, but everyone will be different. Um, so that's kind of how I, but I keep going because it's exciting, right? I keep going because I don't know what's going to happen, and that's why I keep doing it. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. Uh, yeah, so just to repeat the question for the online, does my process change? Um, yes, all the time. You know, I, I would say that uh, you know, my first degree was in writing, and often my process was, oh, I'm going to go sit in a quiet room and write. No, now my practice is far more out there, and I need to go and do a handstand in the middle of a square. Or, you know, so, it's, so it's always changing, but it's how you then attend to that is, is quite difficult. And I, 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 I have a couple PhD students who are looking at creative practice as their process. Um, and for them, it's, it's that work of going, okay, well, how can we help you to find out what's most useful for you to, to explore that? And that's, I suppose, what we do in the practice research cluster is try and find ways that each individual person, for them now, allows that to get those questions or, or to develop. But that's, that's, that, to me, that goes back to the work, right? The work is not, oh, I need to paint something, or the work is not. The work is, how do I attend to the creative thinking? Yeah. Thanks. I'm going to read a few questions from online. So we have um, one question in the chat that I want to read out. If you just scroll, okay. Um, so thank you. She really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Uh, my question is: Have you come across any companies or organizations that have done this idea well, as in hired an artist, hopefully on a permanent basis, to advise said company or organization on policy or anything like that? Yeah. Um, permanent. Yeah. No. Um, it's, it's a great question, and I, I have definitely worked with, with organizations who, who have done that. And certainly in Scotland, there's a, there's a bigger push to be, I don't know why I'm, I'm going to pretend you're over there, but you're in there, you're in the internet. Um, uh, there, there are, there, in, in Scotland, there's this idea with a new cultural policy that's been developed is that, you know, rather than saying, okay, we have um, industry here, and we have education here, and we have health here, and we have culture here. What if we took culture and we put it horizontally through all that, and so we situate culture within health, within education, within business, and you put it all of those ways. Now, I like that idea, and I will come back to your question, but just to kind of critique that is that to what extent does the art become um, instrumentalized to do certain things that it's not art's jobs to do? I go back to the people at, at the Gallery of Modern Art who were sort of saying, oh, I want to go and fix these young kids with that. So, but is that the same thing? I, I certainly have done projects within, within healthcare where people have come back to me and gone, oh, great, you're going you're gonna to work with people to make them feel better. And I keep having to go, not my job. My job is not to make you people feel better because that's not what art's purpose is. Art's purpose is to ask difficult, uncomfortable questions. And, and so you have to negotiate that. Now, I've, I've come across quite a few organizations that, that have situated culture and art at the heart of what they do. Weirdly, you might not know this, McSween's Haggis, so the Haggis Company of Scotland, um, their CEO is, is actually, uh, it, it's, it's sort of been passed down from, from father to daughter, but actually she, didn't, she never wanted it. She wanted to actually go to art school. So she went to art school, and then she, when she got the company, she's like, fuck it, let's just put art to the center of this. And actually from that, it's done really, really well. And actually I know that there's a lot of smaller organizations that sort of embed uh, cultural activities. But it is that negotiation, is that how do you make an argument from, and this is about ontologies, which is you know, fundamentally about reality, is that if you're organizing an, uh, a company whose fundamental job is make money, sell a widget, how then do you bring in an ontology which is not about making money but about asking difficult questions, right? That's really difficult. And so all of those, uh, certainly I've done projects that are um, with organizations that are open to that, but they're never really permanent. They're temporary reflective processes about a specific element. We need to change this part. Let's get in someone to change this part rather than all the way. Hopefully that answered that. Thank you. Um, can I have a the mic back. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question from online, then we'll go back to the in-person uh, question. But we have a question here actually from our senior dean of the faculty, Guillermo Costa. Hello. Hi, Guillermo. Uh, the research culture is so entrenched in traditional methods. Huh. How do you convince them, meaning the skeptics? Yeah. Uh, I, <laughs> so I often, in my, in my research lectures, I often talk about the two Dr. Shrugs. And my brother is a reconstructive plastic surgeon. He's very much. Um, a researcher who is fundamentally interested in 
quantitative proven facts, and I am not. <laughs> I'm also a doctor. Um, and I, we have a tendency, because that's who we are, and, and I should say we, we really get along. We have a lot of fun together, but we clash. We clash because of this. Um, and I, we had an argument really recently about something, which I won't get into, but I started talking about culture and art as, as you know, these are, these are also important facts. And he went, no, no, I want facts. I want facts. I want, you know, if, 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 I, if I jump off a cliff, I'm going to fall. I'm going to fall. That's a fact. You can't argue with that. I'm like, that's true. That is a fact. And if you do step off a cliff, you do fall. And that is a quantitative, um, verifiable fact. What I am interested in is what happens to that person at the bottom of that. Do they get up? Do people help them? Is there some way that their, their experience allows them to land better? Um, do they have some sort of lasting experiences beyond that fall or that trip? Because those are also facts, right? So it's not about quantitatively and qualitatively being um, at odds, because they're not. What you're trying to say is actually try and value these things at a, separate, uh, at a separate way. So if you are interested in human existence, and this is where I went back with my brother, and I said, if you're interested in that person, and that person is real, and that person is going to trip and fall, and that gravity is a fact, are you also interested in them beyond that? So how can we create the value between the person here and the person here, which is the same person? So it's about the, 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 the ways that we make those um, links between those two different ontologies. I did a recent project with an with with a, uh, osteoporosis project um, uh, where I think was a really good example of how this can, can work really well is because that I just met these nurses who were really interested in, in, in osteo, 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 osteoporosis. I was really interested in creative works within healthcare. We started having a chat. We just had a conversation. We just said, where are, where are meeting points? Can creativity be useful for you to think through? Great. Can I work with you to explore this? This is what it's going to look like. Is that useful to you? Is this you? So it's about relationships. So I think it's a fundamentally about how you develop those relationships. And, and for any organization, for any university, I would say set up interdisciplinary relationships between those things. It's not about the fight, it's about how you bring them together. Yeah. Yeah. So just to paraphrase, to, so it's caught on the mic. Is it's it's how do we how do we how do we reflect on those um, different ideas of value within uh, cultural organizations who want the statistical because that's kind of where it comes from. Is that, am I touching on that? Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think again it's a little bit about the same question about how you make those relationships because the quantitative is is useful. I'm not going to deny that the quantitative is useful, but uh, the, uh, the arguments that certainly we're, we're making in Scotland, but I think are, are everywhere, is that actually, if you are fundamentally basing your cultural organisation on quantitative works, how are you able to then communicate the affect of the emotional, the tacit stuff, which is the whole reason you're there in the first place, right? So that's why I think the argument that about creative practice being embedded becomes really useful. So um, we just had an industry panel for our, for our MA Arts Festivals of Cultural Management, which was then looking at um, how could we create case studies that, are, that communicate the effective emotional things, not we had 12 people. The problem with that, though, and this is where the argument comes in, is those often take more time and they often take a little bit more depth. They often take a little bit more money, really, when it comes down to it. Because it's not about, I can count people with this clicker and that's it. It's about an artist pulling that stuff out. So to me, the argument goes back to the cultural organizations and saying, is, is this important to you? Is, is that value important to you? Because that's what you do. And if it is, we can't communicate it through, through the numbers. One of the, one of the th arguments I often get is go, you know, we want to do a project about how many people enjoy activities um, or in, in cultural activities in Edinburgh, so we're going to count them. How is counting them going to indicate if we enjoy them, right? <laughs> that doesn't work. That's, that's, a, that's an ontological clash. Numbers don't mean joy, right? So, I mean, if you're mathematics, then it might mean joy, but, but you know what I mean. 
So I, I, it's a difficult question, but it, again, I think it goes back to those relationships with those cultural organizations going, you might think that policymakers and funders want numbers, but actually they want to know that they're doing, having real impact. And actually that impact only comes from the qualitative effective stuff. Hope that answered that. That's my, my take on that anyway. Thank you, Anthony. Um, I'm going to take one more quick question from the uh, Q&A online because it's a little different from the others. To what degree is your research participant-led? And do you make room for that? And does it work? I think you kind of were yeah. touching on that a little bit in your last time. But I think, uh, thank you for the question. It's, it's very interesting. Um, <sighs> chapter three of my PhD, go for it. <laughs> um, no, but the, but the, I guess, I, I guess it's difficult because, and, and not to get too much into this, is that I am very interested in, in for example, in a lot of my rural arts project, is, is how we create relationships that are of relationships of equity. That doesn't mean to necessarily say that's participant-led. That's often about me being an outsider coming in and also having an idea. Um, often the point about the participant-led stuff becomes a little bit instrumentalized. So then you go back to that idea of someone going, well, I want, I want X and you as an artist just come and have to deliver that. And that's fine, there are ways that we can do that. But I think sometimes, that especially with, with the, the cultural sector, is actually about saying to that participant or that group of people or those, you know, that small community, okay, you can lead the ideas, but you have to lead the ideas with a question, not an output. So rather than saying, um, you know, I want, um, I, um, I want everybody, I want all the children to be more engaged in cultural activity at the end of it you come in and you say, well, actually, let's frame that as a question, and we'll explore that question together. And so what is cultural engagement for young people, right? So it's how you shift that. So rather than saying it's, it's an output-led, you make that participant-led process be led by a question which won't have a clear output, it's, but it allows that creativity to explore that. I hope I it challenged. I hope I, yeah. Um, I think we're at, we're out of time now, so I want to thank you so much. And everybody, please feel free to stick around for coffee. Ask you know maybe a little one-on-one -on -one with Anthony. Thank you to all of our online guests. The event was recorded, uh, and we'll make sure to post it online shortly. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you so much thank for having you. me. Another thank round you very of applause. Much.